What's the bottom of the truth? Well, sometimes that is better. Like a lot of millennial weebs, I got my anime start with Dragon Ball Z on Toonami. Happened to catch it at the beginning of the series, and it seemed cool enough. The alien with the big hair comes down, kidnaps his nephew, Goku and the green guy fight him, then Goku friggin' dies. That blew my ten year old mind, and what followed still fired my imagination. Snake Way, King Kai, the promise that Goku could come back. Death was just the beginning. And given the explosion of Isekai in the last ten years, I wasn't the only one inspired by Goku treating the afterlife as one big adventure. And if you're here watching this video, you're interested, like I was and am, about how we got here. So let's take a dive into the great beyond of Japanese myths and religions and how it brought us some of our favorite anime. There are two religions at the cornerstone of Japanese history, Shinto and Buddhism. Shinto was native, but wasn't codified and written down until the Kojiki and the Nihon Shoki in the 600s and 700s CE. Buddhism was officially introduced not too long before, around 550 CE. This period of Japan is generally regarded by historians as when it became Japan, instead of like Proto-Japan, Yamato Kingdom, so these two religions are equally important to Japanese identity. For quick contrast, Shinto is a shamanistic religion, and its, in its practice is focused a lot on the idea of kami, spirits of nature, man, and myth. The way to deal with these kami is very material, centered around shrines and ritual observance. Like, one of the first things you learn about Japanese culture is no shoes in the house, and that's a Shinto idea. A lot of Shinto is focused on ritual purity, keeping spaces clean according to certain rules. Buddhism, meanwhile, is indifferent to the real world, and I'm really, really butchering Buddhism here, but the focus of the religion is about escaping the cycle of life and death. That doesn't mean that it doesn't have ritual practices too, but the rituals aren't the substance of the religion, but are meant to be symbolic. Because of this, the two religions complement each other, and one point where they especially complemented each other was death. Death is considered the most impure thing in Shinto, second only to blood. One tradition when there was a death in the family was to cover the family shrine with a white cloth to protect it from the impurity, and in ancient Japan, the dead were never interred within the bounds of the village. They were always left outside, in the woods or on roadsides. So Buddhism was able to fill the gap, because they didn't find death impure and polluting. And it was a gradual process, taking hundreds of years for Buddhism to take over funeral rituals. And that's because while the Buddhists weren't afraid of the dead, they also weren't concerned with it. Just kind of neutral. But the Buddhists were concerned with the death of a Buddha, somebody who had reached enlightenment. The OG Buddha, Siddhartha Gautama, was cremated, and gradually this became acceptable for everyone because the Japanese strain of Buddhism was a branch of the faith that believed that everyone had Buddha nature that just needed to be realized. That's how you get around to a popular phrase for Japanese people, born Shinto, die Buddhist. This meant Japanese concepts of the afterlife were tied into Buddhism too, even tying back into Shinto. But for now, I'm going to talk about the thing that everyone knows about dying Buddhist, reincarnation. Reincarnation is a cliche in anime by this point, be it as a slime, a jobless infant, a spider, or just about anything. There are a lot of ways it can occur within Japanese Buddhism or Buddhism as a whole. Rebirth wasn't very well defined in the time and direct teachings of the Buddha though he determined that knowing past lives via retrocognition was an important part of being liberated from the cycle of birth and death. He also maintained that it was the desire to live that caused rebirth, that intention caused rebirth, along with your karma, a spiritual record of deeds. This earlier, more philosophical kind of death and rebirth, 
can be seen in some isekai where the rebirth cycle is something that occurs automatically, not under any conscious power. A few good recent examples are My Next Life as a Villainess and Descendants of a Bookworm. My Next Life as a Villainess starts with the lead, Katarina Kleiss, experiencing retrocognition of a past life, though in a very cartoony way of smacking her head in a fall when retrocognition is meant to be one of the five higher forms of knowledge according to the Buddha, cultivated through intense meditation and self-knowledge. But her memories of her past life show someone who died at the age of 17 and was obsessed with Otome games. The karma of her prior life is unclear as to whether she was sent to this new life as a higher or lower station than her previous life, but the intent side couldn't be clearer. Obsessed with Otome games, her consciousness moved into that of a newborn villainess from an Otome game. Her knowledge of her past, particularly knowing the rules of the Otome game from her past life, fit in with another type of higher knowledge that the Buddha taught, clairvoyance. That, along with clairaudience, just means to see and hear things far off, and are the paths to enlightenment by understanding the hearts of others. This part probably isn't deliberate on the part of the writers, but it is a neat parallel. She leverages her knowledge of her past life for how to win at this life by knowing the hearts of others and having deeper knowledge of the world she's living in. Of course, unlike Katarina, the goal in Buddhism isn't to win at life, but to use this knowledge to escape the cycle of death and rebirth, called samsara. Knowledge plays heavily into the other example we'll look at in this category, Ascendance of a Bookworm. Mine's migration is sort of backwards compared to Katerina's. Her consciousness was either directly injected into her, into her new body as a child instead of as a newborn, or this could be interpreted as her awakening to her old memories at that age. Her reincarnation is very clearly shaped by her old self's dying wish to be surrounded by books. The realm she's introduced to is like Renaissance Europe, but pre-printing press, and to make her wish a reality, she too has to leverage the knowledge from her previous life to grow as a person and make people's lives better. So here too, you have a character using direct past life knowledge to engage with the world they've been thrust into, and being thrust into it directly because of the life they lived previously without any, any intermediary force. There's a transitional example before I get to the other side of reincarnation, and that's jobless reincarnation. Like mine and Katerina, Rudius takes his old memories with him to the next world. Though unlike those two, he has full knowledge with him from the moment his newborn body opens its eyes, and he takes full advantage of having the mental capacity and knowledge of an adult as a baby to get ahead in life. The idea that he's just a traveler in this body is kind of reinforced whenever he meets up with the Hitogami in the Void world. In this spirit world, Rudius still shows up in the body of the th schlubby 34-year-old man who died, and not the child he still is when he meets Hitogami the first time. And the question is, well, why? The cynical take would be that he's still obsessed with his wasted former life and is defined by it, dogged by it. But why is that former life more permanent than this one? And the Buddhist answer for that is that it isn't. The core concept at the very heart of Buddhism is anatman or anatta, which coincidentally has nothing to do with the Japanese word for you, as in the second person pronoun you, anatta. It just means non-self. That what we are at a fundamental level is just an aggregate of the different things that make us us. Bodies, minds, memories, impulses, what Buddhism calls dispositions, including our past life memories and karma. Rudius becomes more than his past self, but that new one is no more real or essential than the old one. The other side of reincarnation is one that's guided by a divine entity. I say divine and not God because Buddhism doesn't believe in creator gods, though Buddhism, particularly the Japanese branch and East Asian branch in general, has absorbed a lot of different religious ideals of higher beings, particularly the Bodhisattva, the enlightened figure that sits on the very brink of nirvana but chooses not to go over the edge out of an obligation to help other people. 
But in Japan, these bodhisattva overlap with the kami and the busatsu, regular folk who have achieved a Buddha level of spirituality. Whatever the exact nature of the guide, Japanese Buddhism has room for it. Buddhism and Shinto play into each other again to provide a number of godlike guides, some of whom migrated over from Shinto or other traditions. A whole pantheon. What they don't have is a smug failure goddess with blue hair. But Aqua's brief time with Kazuma before being swept off into his adventure does illustrate another piece of Buddhist religion, the Bhava Chakra. In their conversation, Aqua presents a few different reincarnation options for Kazuma before pitching the fantasy adventure world where he is recruited to go fight the Demon King. She says that he can go to heaven, though it's a boring place and he wouldn't have his physical body. He could also be reborn from zero into a new life. The Bhava Chakra is a detailed map of where a consciousness can go after it dies. A sidebar here is I'm saying consciousness and not soul, again going back to that whole anatta, anatman thing. The soul, the essential you, does not exist. Attaining that realization is parcel to the whole nirvana thing, so I'm going with consciousness even though that's not quite accurate either. But this video is going to have enough Sanskrit and Pali words floating around. Anywho, the Bhava Chakra shows where you can go after you die. It shows higher and lower planes, though they aren't choices so much as rewards and punishments due to your karma. But the ultimate point is that none of them are a final reward, except for the way out indicated by the Buddha or a Bodhisattva in the picture itself. The lower realms are the animal realm, which sounds cute unless you've seen Watership Down or Red Call of the Wild, then Who Boy. The Hell Realms, divided into 18 sub-realms, your boy Dante could never. And the Hungry Ghosts Realm, which is kind of an ironic punishment thing. The higher realms kind of suck too, though. There's the Human Realm, then the God Realm, and the Demigod or Ashura Realm. Now, you might know from like One Piece or that beat-em-up video game Ashura's Wrath that Ashuras are usually portrayed as a devil-like figure. The gods live long and blissful lives, but that is burning out the karma that is their reward that allowed them to achieve godhood or devahood to begin with. And they then, after an eon, burn out their positive karma to go back in lower into the cycle. The asuras have the power of the gods, but none of the joy, and spend their time fighting each other or fighting the gods. The Bhava Chakra chart will often have a moon at the top, or in some Chinese, Korean, or Japanese versions, a picture of the heavenly pure land. And that kind of fits the picture of what Aqua was talking about. Even though the afterworld presented in Konosuba doesn't see nirvana and the cessation of existence as the end goal, their heaven, a place she describes as boring sunshine for all eternity, has a similar role to the Pure Land, which is a place for those on the path to Buddhahood to be free of earthly torments, to let them focus on the last leg of enlightenment. Part 2. Realms so with the Bhava Chakra, you have a lot of realms and different places you can go after death. And even Shinto has something to say on the matter of other realms that human spirits can pass to. And this has given rise to some of the most notable places in anime and manga. So what we're going to do here is draw our own Bhava Chakra for two big, different big name stories, Bleach and Dragon Ball. Starting with Bleach, you have the human realm, then soul society, then up here the sub-realm in the soul society of the spirit king, and then Waco Mundo. From what we've discussed already, you can already figure out where some of these different places fit in within the Bhava Chakra. The human realm is the human realm. The soul society definitely fits in somewhat with the Deva realm and also kind of with the Ashura realm. They do a lot of fighting and are not all like purely good. Waco Mundo also kind of overlaps with the Ashura realm and the Hungry Ghosts realm. Down there you have both a society of savage creatures that are constantly hungry, literally hollow of a part of themselves who sate that hunger by consuming souls, either their fellows in a cannibalistic feast or humans from the living world. On the other hand, you have the Menos Grande in their three tiers, wielding awesome power and more advanced forms and intelligence, 
who are more like the Asherahs, though more chaotic than pure evil when left to their own devices. The original mission of the Soul Reapers, before the anime became another shonen battle fest, and I loved Bleach in its time, but let's be real, it lost its unique selling point fast, actually involves Shinto beliefs around the dead and Shintoism in general. Hollows follow the Japanese tradition of obake, which subbed anime viewers might recognize as similar to the Japanese word bakemono, a general word for monster. Obake generally are vengeful spirits, and these can include vengeful ghosts of humans. A good historical example of Obake is Sugawara no Michizane, who lived in the 800s and served in the imperial court during the Heian era of Japan. He was falsely accused of misconduct and died in exile outside of Kyoto. Then misfortune befell Kyoto, allegedly plagues and bad weather and an earthquake or two, until Shinto priests enshrined him as a kami called Tenjin, who is still worshipped today. This fits what you can see in Bleach of the Soul Reapers purifying hollows when they use their Zanpakuto to put them down, sending the soul on to where it was meant to go. The Soul Reapers in general fill a Shintoist role of maintaining the balance between worlds. Things like the sweeper between the world of the living and soul society are meant to enforce the separation of realms, and soul reapers restore the natural balance where it has been disrupted by hollows. And that's a lot of what Shinto is about, maintaining and restoring the balance between spaces. Dragon Ball's afterlife is more straightforward. It's always important when talking about Dragon Ball to remember that Toriyama's background was in gag manga like Dr. Slump. You're really not meant to take it too seriously, but that said, the influence of Buddhist and Shinto ideas about death are there in ways that are obvious and less so. One of those bodhisattva I mentioned before, who guides the deceased, is called Emma, also known as Yama in Sanskrit. Combine Yama and Emma, and you get King Yama, who, like Yama, is one to judge newly dead souls arriving in the afterworld. Only the extra good get to keep their bodies in the afterlife, like Goku or in filler many of the other Z fighters, which has some parallels to Pure Land Buddhism, reaching a higher place where you can just focus on improving yourself. So the afterworld is always seen, at least for those who keep their bodies, as another place to train, and to receive the gifts of divine wisdom to push yourself further, like the Kaioken, Gohan spirit training, Goku getting to SSJ3, though he did that on his own, even the cultivation of God key further on in Dragon Ball Super. As for the bad guys... Good morning, party Try to smile. I, you'll like it. I don't think Stuffed Animals on Parade is one of the 18 sub-realms of the Hell Realm that's shown in the Bafa Chakra, but it shows that the worst souls go through a longer and more intensive purging of negative karma until they can proceed for another go. The time scale listed for the Hell Realms in Buddhism is eons, so Frieza got off real lucky being resurrected for Return of F and later for the Tournament of Power. For different reasons and in different ways, Bleach and Dragon Ball also blur the lines between life and death. Toriyama made death a solvable problem via the Dragon Balls, but even without them, life and death is not really shown to be very severely divided. Baba the Witch and King Kami seem to have a free ability to travel at least to King Yema's entryway into the afterlife, and while alive, Goku could freely teleport there using instant transmission, and could bring other living people there, a la Gohan in the Buu Saga to train with Elder Kai. Even back in Dragon Ball, Baba brought Grandpa Gohan back without the Dragon Balls for a period. The difference between the living and the dead in Dragon Ball is more normative than anything. The dead need to stay in the afterworld aside from odd exceptions, and the living get to stay in the living world. But there isn't this great metaphysical barrier between the two worlds like you see in other pieces of media or in the traditional Jewish, Christian, Muslim understanding of things. It's just another place, a different place, and one that should stay separate from others. The Edo-era Shinto scholar Hirata Atsutane 
posited that dead souls in Shinto belief go to a sort of hidden realm ruled over by Okuni Nushi, which just translates to Great Lord of the Country, who's one of the great kami almost on par with Amaterasu. The only Shinto scriptures, the Kojiki and the Nihon Shoki, have a different take with a Hades-like realm called Yomi. When the creator goddess Izanami died, the creator god Izanagi tried to find her there, but she had already become rotten and horrible to behold, so he fled. Yomi is never mentioned again in Shinto tradition, probably because Buddhism took over so much to do with death up until Shinto revivals in the 18th and 19th centuries. But what you get from bits and pieces about Shinto death between Obake and the story of Yomi hits back to that point that there is no metaphysical barrier, just that the worlds need to stay separate because they should stay separate. Bleach has stronger barriers between the worlds, like the need for soul reapers to have a gigai, a fake body, to really be in the world of living and not just a spiritual presence, like hollows or like the cleaner trying to destroy what passes in between the worlds. But if there's an overarching theme to Bleach, it's about the need to mix between the worlds. Ichigo, who's a little bit of everything, is the strongest guy. While Aizen experiments with mixing Hollow and Soul Reaper and with evolving the Menos Hollows, while the rigid and bureaucratic Soul Society keeps getting caught flat-footed. There's probably a theme there about Japanese isolation and how strength comes from taking what's good about your culture and mixing that with other cultures. And so that examines the point from Shinto about keeping worlds apart and subverts it, sorta? The rushed ending of the Bleach manga is one of the great tragedies of shonen manga, so the ending message is kind of muddled. Either way, both Bleach and Dragon Ball borrow a fair bit from the Shinto idea that separate things should be kept separate particularly with regard to the living and the dead, but play around with it to create some of the most interesting parts of their stories. Part 3. Syncretize! Of course, anime takes a lot of influence from things that come way outside Japanese tradition. There's a metric ton of Christianity throughout the anime greats along with video games classic and modern, like Dragon Quest or Bayonetta or Devil May Cry. It's a bit less frequent that this extends to portrayals of death and the afterlife, though, rather than just the inclusions of angels, demons, the Catholic Church in particular for some reason, and a lot of Christian imagery. There's one big exception that came up when I was researching for this panel. An obscure group, and stop me if you've heard of this deep cut before, death spirits called Shinigami. I've already talked a bit about death guides, the bodhisattva like Emma and the others, but Shinto and Buddhism don't have a tradition of someone who comes at the moment of death, either to complete the death or to usher the soul of the dead from the living world into the great beyond. The term Shinigami doesn't really crop up in Japanese literature until the 1700s, and I'm trusting Wikipedia on this because the source they cite is a book, and the book's title and author is written entirely in Japanese. But this does kind of make sense from all of the other research I did for this. Anyway, that's because it is a Western idea coming from a few different European Mideastern origins. Of course, the Shinigami and Bleach aren't dedicated to killing, but rather to fulfilling the role already mentioned. Though they will take the souls that have gone hollow and violently purify them, allowing them to pass on to the next world. The more traditional role of a reaper comes from Death Note. Ryuk, Rem, and the others, the Shinigami bearers of the titular Death Note, don't play a role that's recognized in Japanese Buddhist or Shinto traditions, where the balance of life and death is a natural thing that doesn't need the kami to push it along, though it does need correcting if it gets out of balance, like with the obake or the hollows in Bleach. In the Old Testament, there is the angel of death, who God created on the first day, though different parts of the Torah and the Jewish Talmudic tradition assign a litany of angels of death, similar to the whole crew of Shinigami you get in Death Note. Their role is not an essential part of the natural cycle, and are portrayed more as a punishment or calamity from God. But in that kind of Lord works in mysterious ways capacity, and this too is more fitting of the portrayal of the Shinigami in Death Note. 
Ryuk and his folks aren't bringing the wrath of God, but are playing people against each other with their notes, playing a similar role of being antagonistic to people, showing a more hostile relationship between humans and the natural spiritual world than you see in Japanese religion. Shinigami were a big takeaway from Western religious ideas, but I'll end this video showing two examples of how a more Christian heaven and hell work their way into Japanese media. As far as going up, there's Angel Beats, a neat high school action anime from 2010 that told the story of a guerrilla student group fighting against a super-powered student council trying to get them to conform. The trick was the students who did conform would disappear from the school. For broad spoilers, if that counts for a 12-year-old anime, the school is actually a sort of purgatory in the original Catholic sense of things. The conformity was that the student council is striving for the students to have a chance to live an ordinary high school life, a chance that was denied to all of the protagonists because, spoiler alert, they're all dead. They died as teenagers, and the world they were brought into is designed to bring them a sense of healing and peace. Which you can see in Angel Beats is already pretty familiar to the types of afterlife I've already talked about. And if I were raised Japanese, you could peg this as a Buddhist story, if not for invoking the name of angels themselves. A person passes on and is guided to a specific afterlife based on their experience and stays there until they've resolved an imbalance in their soul. It fits with one of the other realms of the Bhava Chakra, or even the description of the Pure Land. It also fits with a more Christian conception of the afterlife, because what follows after the school is a complete unknown, implied to be a one-way trip and not cyclical. On the other side, you have the trip down. And for this one, I'm going to dig up the only manga deep cut of this panel, Devilman Lady. Not the anime, which I watched in 2018 in a desperate craving for more Devilman content after binging Crybaby with friends in one feverish night. I'm picking up Devilman Lady, the obscure sequel, because the OG Devilman doesn't really deal with death, the afterlife, or even going beyond the human realm where the story occurs, although it obviously borrows entirely from Christian ideas of hell and demonology. But Devilman Lady actually takes us there and explores Go Nagai's interesting ideas about Christianity via the main character, Devilman Akira himself. See, in Devilman Lady, it's revealed that the universe keeps resetting itself. Every time the demons overrun the earth and wipe out humanity, God resets everything back to zero and the whole process plays out over again, except it only plays out in the living world. In Hell, the damned and the fallen demons just keep piling up and up. The OG Devilman, Akira, chooses to go to Hell. When Jun, the titular Devilman Lady, meets him, he explains why he chose that to her. In his words, If hell is not governed by a moral law, then heaven is not ruled by justice either. Heaven is nothing but a prison for those who are absolutely obedient to God. One can sense a bit or more of Nagai's own feelings coming through here. The critique could be seen as atheist, because Nagai is condemning the idea that a just God could sentence anyone to eternal torment and boy, some of the torments are graphic. Whatever else Go Nagai is, his work is very violent. But you can also see the same seeds of Buddhism in this critique. A critical point in the Abrahamic religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, is that time and the universe are a one-way trip. While God is timeless and there is a fixed beginning and, important to all of them, a fixed end, which makes the urgency of getting right with God all the more pertinent. But here Nagai takes a spin on it as something cyclical like Buddhism or Hinduism, which suggests that the universe itself goes through a cycle of rebirth. In Devilman Lady, Dante's Inferno is also a historical account. Dante actually went to hell in heaven and came back to report it. So that's the other Japanese influence you see there, that while there are barriers between the realms, these barriers are surmountable. So again, it's more like Shinto, where there is not such a severe difference between the realms of spirit and matter compared to Christianity. Thank you again for watching. Please remember to like, subscribe, follow me on Twitter if you'd like. 
this one's kind of lighter on the video content this time around because I made it for the Otakon convention in Washington, D.C., so I figured I may as well share it out. And now there's Xenoblade Chronicles 3, which is going to need most of my attention, so could be a bit before there's more. See y'all later.